Hi there, Spatial Shark back with you for Unit 4, Political Geography, Patterns and Processes. This is a picture of Queen Victoria, who was one of the longest reigning monarchs in British history. Her husband, Prince Albert, there in the background. And uh, at that time, there was the saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire. And we've got an African prince here receiving a gift from the Queen of the Holy Bible. So this is what we talk about in Unit 4, where we talk about colonialism and imperialism and this idea that the spread of Indo-European languages that we learned about in Unit 3 and the spread of Christianity that we learned about in Unit 3, it's all through the vehicle of political geography patterns and processes. So that's uh, very important that we understand that. So what we got here is basic uh, political terminology. There are some things that you need to know, some vocab, right? And hopefully you've read the AMSCO book. Hopefully you've, um, you know, started looking at the Quizlet uh, and you know some of these terms, you know some of these vocabulary terms. And so we're going to look at things like controlling space, um, power relationships, who matters, who actually gets to vote, who's a citizen, who counts, who's marginalized, who's not really important in a political uh, entity. And does the majority always rule? Or is sometimes the rights of the minority uh, a powerful thing? And so when we look at maps, we know that this is one of our big skills is being able to illustrate some of these uh, political geography patterns and processes. And so that's gonna be a big important thing in this unit. Um, territoriality is what we are. We're, we're only the most evolved of the animals. And you know, you look at all the creatures of the world and they're always out there scoping out their territory. And humans are kind of like that too. You know, this is Michael's room. <laughs> so, but it's also Spatial Shark's office when he needs to record a video. Uh, and so you may have problems with your siblings who come into your room. And, you know, we may have problems with our neighbors who, you know, enter our property. And we may have problems with countries that enter our space. And that's what we're, you know, we're always fighting about land. We always think it's something cultural, it's language, it's religion or whatever. It's always about territory. It's always about space. It's always about land. And so the, the rise of the modern nation state that we see in the world, the fragmentation, the compartmentalization of the earth into nearly 200 political entities uh, and the national identities that go along with the compartmentalization of that space is what Unit 4 is really all about. Um, today, we have what we call countries. You know, geographers prefer that we use the term states. We'll talk about that. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, uh, as we do our map quizzes to get you ready for your AP exam at the end of the year, we've done North America, we've done South America, we're doing Europe now, we're going to have to do Africa and Asia next. Uh, you need to know the compartmentalization of territory and how that looks on the earth. Now, this is a sign from just a couple of years ago, 2011, welcome to Africa's youngest nation. Uh, they're referring to South Sudan, uh, which is younger than most of you. But these words are used incorrectly all the time, because what is a nation? What is a state? What is a nation state? Uh, and again, the Quizlet, really important here, because topic 4.1, all right, one of the few times you're going to see that word define in the CED, you're going to have to define what these terms mean. So the word country, right, we use that term to mean, oh, I'm going to go to France, right, a country. That comes from a Latin root word, contra, it means against. And, and you, were, you were French if you were against those other people over there. So that's where the word country comes from. Uh, and what they mean is they mean a state, which is from the word status. And status, you have to have several conditions to meet the status of being a state. You got to have politically organized territory. There has to be a boundary. You have to have a permanent population within that territory. You have to be recognized by other states. They have to agree that you have a right to exist. And then you have to have what we call sovereignty. It's a big fancy word. It means that you control your own domestic and foreign affairs. No other state can tell you what to do, right? That's sovereignty. If you are limited in your sovereignty, you're not a state, okay? So what do horses have to do this? It's actually a fun story. In the Indo-European language, back in the proto-Indo-European days, uh, the word for horses 
actually had a prefix, S-T. And so you think of all the words that have to do with horses that start with the letters S-T in English. We talk about the stirrup, where you put your feet, right? And you have a stable where horses live. And, and when horses go berserk, it's a stampede. Uh, and, and, you know, when a horse is a male horse and he's going to procreate with a bunch of female mares, we call that horse a stud. And, and there's all these, you know, words that start with S-T, right, that have to do with horses because horses enabled people to project uh, political power. And you think about the great Khan, Genghis Khan, who had the largest empire in the ancient world. Uh, and today, all Mongolians are genetically related to the great Genghis Khan. Uh, there's only three million Mongolians in the world. He had something like a thousand wives and many thousands of children. But that word for horses finds its way into the word status, right? And that's where that prefix comes for statehood. And it has to do with land. Today, there's a lot of countries in Central Asia that are known as Stan. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And, and that's the, the, the stand suffix of that. It means the land of whoever the nationality group is. And that stand is for status. And again, it has to do with land. And then you think about all the countries that are in English that have the word land in their name. You know, we talk about Greenland and Iceland and New Zealand and, and even Germany in German is Deutschland. So land is a big part of what we're talking about. And remember, I said all conflicts are down to basically control over territory. So the word nation is not interchangeable with country. I know we do that all the time. Right. You'll see it. Even educated people on the news will talk about nations and states and they'll constantly misuse the two terms. Nation is a measure of cultural homogeneity. I feel Nigerian or I feel Chinese. Right. It's not China. It's not Nigeria. It's the feeling of belonging. It's the sensation of togetherness. That's nationality. It's an identity. OK, remember, appearance is a poor predictor of who somebody is. So when we think about homogeneity, we think about having the same language, having the same religion, having the same ethnic background, having a shared history, feeling of togetherness. OK, that's not the state. So the state is the place that has territory and sovereignty. The nation is the group of people. All right. So you're talking about France as a state and the French people. Is the, is the nation. So then what is a nation state? That's when you have a single political entity with a territory, with a population, with sovereignty, and oh, by the way, one culturally homogeneous group of people lives within that space. That's a nation state, okay? So we have to combine those two words. Make sure if you were defining that, you can't just say it's a nation and a state. <laughs> you have to actually write out a culturally homogeneous group of people who share a territory that has defined you know, boundaries, permanent population, and can control all of their own domestic and, and, and external affairs. So what is the difference? Because you hear all the time, people say things like England, Great Britain, UK, United Kingdom. What does that really mean? Well, here's a great diagram. England, along with Wales and Scotland, make up the island of Great Britain. The other island over there is Ireland, which is not all one state. There's two states on that island because along with England, Wales, and Scotland, Northern Ireland makes up part of what we call the United Kingdom, right? And then when you say British, right, you mean pretty much anybody on the island of Great Britain. So Welsh people can be British, Scottish people can be British, English people can be British, but usually they would prefer to identify themselves by their unique identity. I'm English, I'm Scottish, I'm Welsh. Okay, there are differences of language and of shared history, but the United Kingdom is England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Ireland itself is its own state. It's been independent since the 19, early 1920s. 1919, it fought for its independence. And so when you see that, you know, what's the difference between the British Isles, which includes Ireland, but they're not included politically in the United Kingdom. And Great Britain, the big island, is just 
the part that where England and Scotland and Wales are. It can be confusing, but you do need to understand these different levels and these different ideas within political terminology. All right. So now we have to think about some different permutations of those words, nation and state. Because what if we have a group of people who are culturally homogeneous, but they don't have a state of their own, or they do have territory, but they don't have sovereignty, okay? So we call those people a stateless nation, right? Because they are a nation, but they don't have state, right? Or they don't have sovereignty within their territory. So one good example, Palestinians, okay? They live in an area that is, you know, carved out of this area in the Middle East, the state of Israel, and, and what will be a Palestine, right? The UN has already said it's going to be split. It's going to be shared. Uh, in the 1940s, uh, the Jewish state agreed to that separation. Uh, the Arab countries did not. And so conflict has resulted, right? But there is this plan that there will be a Palestinian state. Currently, they are a stateless nation. Group of people don't have their own state. What else? We've got the Kurds, right? The Kurds are living in several different states. There are Kurds in Iraq. There are Kurds in Turkey. There are Kurds all over the northern area of the Middle East and the Tigris Euphrates Valley. They were promised their own state from what was at one time the Ottoman Empire. They helped the allies fight against the Ottoman Turks. But at the end of the war, they got hosed and nobody gave them their own state. Instead, they created an Iraq, they created a Syria, they created a Lebanon, uh, they created a bunch of places in the Middle East, but they never created a Kurdistan. And even still today, this is a sore subject with the Kurds. They want their own state. But who will give up the territory, right? Will Iraq give up land? Will Turkey give up land? You know, none of these states are going to go, ooh, can, can you take away some of our territory and give it to the Kurds? Because we're just feeling very generous. It's just not going to happen, especially when you consider that sometimes these territories, these places have resources. And in the Middle East, we know we're talking about oil. So nobody's going to sit there and say, hey, you know, let's give the Kurds some territory uh, because it's the right thing to do. Nobody's going to do that. All right. Closer to home. Puerto Ricans. Since 1952, they've been given what we call regional autonomy. They can make their own local decisions but they cannot make their own international decisions, okay? So Puerto Ricans are Americans, right? But they don't have statehood within the United States, right? Uh, they're not an independent country. Oftentimes you'll hear people in Puerto Rico say, in my country, right? Technically not a country. Uh, before they were part of the United States, they were part of Spain, right? We took Puerto Rico from Spain after the Spanish-American War in 1898. When I was a little kid, I lived in Puerto Rico for a couple of years. Uh, and at that time in the 1970s, there was a very vigorous independence movement in Puerto Rico. There was also a very vigorous statehood movement in Puerto Rico. But the movement that has generally always had the most popularity is the status quo, to stay the same, to be a commonwealth of the United States, to have that limited autonomy, but not yet full sovereignty and, and not to be a, a state of the United States either. And I'll get to this whole idea of why do we use the word United States if state is more like a country, right? Stay tuned. Uh, other people, the Romani, the gypsies, right? All over Europe, they're originally from India, but they came to, through uh, Egypt up into Europe and therefore they got the name gypsy. It's not a nice word. The, the Romani is the name that they would prefer or the Roma. Uh, and they are very, very prevalent throughout Europe. Um, the Basque people, who live on both sides of the border between France and Spain, uh, up in the Pyrenees Mountains that separates those two countries. Um, the Basque people have their own language, Euskera. Uh, it's a language that is so old, we don't even know how it fits into uh, the languages of Europe. It's not Indo-European by structure, uh, but the Basque people, um, they, they're fiercely proud of their culture, their heritage, and they want to be independent. They don't want to be French. They don't want to be Spanish. They want to be Basque. Um, and within Spain, there's a section of Spain, they call it País Vasco, right? It's the Basque country. And, and that's an interesting thing. But Spain's government is set up that they give a lot of autonomy to the different parts of Spain. The Catalan people have autonomy as well. And again, they don't want to be Spanish. They want to be Catalan. And if you know anything about Barcelona Soccer Club, Mesque un club, right? It's more than a club. 
It's not just an expression of soccer. It's an expression of Catalan identity. Uh, Native Americans, these are stateless nations as well. They do have autonomy on the reservation, but they do not have sovereignty. Tibet was overrun by China recently. No uh, uh, status or statehood for the Tibetan people. The Rohingya in, in Myanmar, stateless nation. There are so many. You can find them all over the world, right? Just go out and Google search stateless nations and just look at what pops up. It's incredible, right? And while we're talking about China, we might as well talk about the Uyghurs as well, right? So we've got a lot of these issues of, of lack of status or lack of territory. Now, that's a stateless nation. What happens if we have a group of people, a single ethnicity, but they don't live in the same state? Well, that's the case of the two Koreas. You got North Korea, you got South Korea. They're both Koreans. They both speak Korean. They're the same ethnic group historically, but because of the war, the, the peninsula was divided into a hardline communist dictatorship North and a capitalist free market South Korea that today is one of the biggest, most robust economies in the world. And you know about your Hyundais and you know about your LGs and you know about your Samsung devices. And, you know, South Korea is an economic miracle of development. North Korea, not so much. Uh, and it's a very hard line, br brutally uh, controlled state. Uh, but that's a multi-state nation because it's the same group of people. They just live on different sides of the demilitarized zone. All right. And now what about you have one state, but what if you have a lot of different people? What if you have a plurality of national identities? And this is a great example of, you know, uh, my new friend Parag Khanna's book, Move, that people are going to be moving all over the world. And of course, it's been happening already for a long time. And so you look at Canada, uh, which has long been very accepting of people from different ethnic backgrounds, different linguistic uh, parts of the world. And, and this is a multinational state, right? A culturally plural state. The United States, of course, is like this too. Um, nowadays, you can see it in Brazil. You can see it in Australia. You can see it in South Africa. A lot of places around the world have more than one ethnic identity living within the country, all right? So nation and state can be, you know, used in a bunch of different ways. Multinational state, multi-state nation, stateless nations, nation states. Make sure if you know the two root words, then you really don't have any problems with any of the other words, to be honest, all right? Now, I told you, why do we use the word United States, all right? Should we switch names, for example, with the United Nations? Because what is the UN? It's a collection of states. What is the United States? <laughs> it's 50 political entities that do not have sovereignty. All right. We tested the theory. Remember when the Southern states said, no, oh, we're out of here. We're going to go. We're going to create the Confederate States of America. And forget you guys. We're going to have slaves. And we fought a war. And guess what? We preserved the union. So we know that American states don't have sovereignty. So why do we use that word United States? So it goes back to the original founding fathers and the old Articles of Confederation government. Remember, these guys fought to get rid of a very strong, centralized British monarch, English monarch. We don't want to be under this British control. We want our own government. We want our own rights. No taxation without representation. So when they created the first American government, remember, it was the Articles of Confederation. And under that document, the federal, the, the, the central government had almost no power. They couldn't tax. They couldn't have a military. Each of the 13 little colonies became, in essence, their own sovereign political entity. That's why they picked the name United States. OK, now. Fast forward about a dozen years or so and everybody found out, hey, this article is a confederation government sucks. <laughs> they couldn't get anything done. And, and very, very big problems were starting to crop up. We almost had a civil war long before the civil war. So they scrapped that plan, as you probably know, all right, and, and certainly the upperclassmen, you've had some of these history classes. We created a much stronger central government under the Constitution. And there, the states had to give up some of their sovereignty. If you remember, they had to ratify the Constitution. 
right? Remember, some of them said, we're not going to do this until we get a Bill of Rights. Okay, we'll stick a Bill of Rights in there. But you still have to say, you're not the top dog, that the United States government is going to be, the federal government is going to be supreme. That's what the Constitution says. It's the supreme law of the land. Now, we will give to the states some powers, right? But we will keep for the United States government other more powerful powers, right? And that's essentially the federal system. And, and again, later in unit four, there's a whole part of this where we're going to talk about unitary and federal governments and how they're structured and how they're built and how they work, right? But that's the little story of the United States. All right. This is that area I was telling you about in the Middle East. And, and you can see the shaded area there where you've got the, the lines, the diagonal lines going through it. That's what would be a Kurdish state. And just so you know, right, going back to the horses story, if they ever create that, it will be called Kurdistan, right? That's what they want to call it. Uh, after the U.S. involvement in Iraq, there was some talk about a Kurdistan because the Kurds helped the United States, right? They, they've been very big allies of the United States in this region of the world. But Turkey certainly isn't going to give up any, any territory, right? Uh, you could theoretically take it away from Iraq, right? But again, Iraq is a sovereign state. And, and you know, most of the time, the world doesn't like it when you just go take territory away from somebody. Um, so one other recent development, if you remember ISIS, right? The Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, the terrorist group. How are they different than other terrorist groups? They actually took control of territory, right? And again, the Kurds were often targeted by ISIS and fought against them and helped the United States in, in a big way. Um, but again, no real movement on creating a Kurdistan. Um, and, and like I said, the Palestinians, you can see, you know, over here, we've got, you know, Israel, and, and what is known as colloquially the West Bank, that is Palestinian territory, as well as the Gaza Strip right here on the coastline. Those are both Palestinian controlled areas. And, and you got to understand this very small. That is the size of New Jersey. Right. That's, you know, a comparison that most of you can reference in your mental map. This is not a big area, but it is very hotly contested, as is. Uh, the other parts of the Middle East as well. Iran and Iraq fought a war against each other for almost the entire decade of the 80s over control of access into the Persian Gulf, uh, which Saudi Arabia won't call it the Persian Gulf because Persia refers to Iran. They call it the Gulf of Arabia. It's, so no, it's an Arab body of water. It's not a Persian body of water. So we're constantly fighting over territory. And we'll talk about water conflicts as well. All right, so how did the modern state really get here? Uh, this goes back into history. If you take AP European history, you're going to learn a lot of this. If you take world history, you're going to learn a lot of this. Um, but, but I'm going to give you a second to read through this slide. Um, this is more the history of the rise of the modern nation state. Uh, it is kind of a European model. Uh, and the Europeans exported this idea of the nation state around the world through colonialism and imperialism. I'll give you a second to read. All right. So hopefully you hit the pause button there for a second and read through the slide. Um, this nation state ideal was exported, like I said, to other parts of the world. So remember that sovereignty, you have to be able to control your internal and your external affairs. So are there still modern day nation states? What I'm going to tell you is it was a lot easier to find nation states a couple hundred years ago, right? French people lived in France. Spanish people lived in Spain, you know? Uh, don't forget in European history, Italy and Germany didn't become Italy and Germany until way later than all of the other Western European countries, states. Italy was a bunch of principalities. There were the papal states. Venice was a state, Florence was a state, Genoa, you know, Naples, the two Sicilies, you know, there were all these different little kingdoms and Germany was the same way. There was Prussia, right? And, and Austria was a German kingdom. And then when Germany unified, they wanted to be a Protestant kingdom. So they kicked the Austrians out because they're Catholics. 
And, and so when you think about nation states, it's always been this struggle for a cohesive identity of nationality within the state boundaries, right? So it was easier to find nation states back in the day. It's not so easy anymore today because of movement, because of migration, because we don't find too many culturally homogeneous groups of people in the world. Japan is often said to be a close idea of a nation state. And that's because Japan historically has not had much diversity within their nationality. But that is changing. Even in Japan today, all right, you're starting to see a tolerance of migration. Now, you know this from Unit 2. Why is Japan suddenly becoming a little more open-minded to the idea of migration? Because they're so old <laughs> and they need young people to come in and work. And so they're going to have to accept that those people who come in are not going to be, you know, Japanese. But they've been so obsessed with their Japanese-ness for so long, all right, their eugenic idea of, you know, keeping uh, control over their national identity. But that is changing. Um, obviously, we see changes of governance in Europe in that time, in the 1700s, 1800s, the elimination of monarchies. Some of those kings lost their heads, right? Like you saw in France, also in England, you had a monarch that was killed. So when you think about the changing in government, but you also see the exportation of a parliamentary style system. Lots of countries in the world have parliaments today because of the British influence. Remember, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Um, but especially in Africa, uh, and it happens in Latin America, it happens in Asia, but Africa especially is where the Europeans exported their ideas politically. And, and the Berlin Conference is a great example of this. Late 1800s and the early 1880s, um, Africa was basically, there's a, there's a cartoon of like a big cake being cut up by Europeans at like this big party. And they're just slicing Africa off and each of them are taking valuable pieces and nobody cared what the black Africans wanted. It was only what the white Europeans wanted. And it's inherently racist. We know that it's one of the reasons why Africa economically was so far behind. Uh, but the, these superimposed boundaries, right, by force, an outsider puts this boundary down. And we'll talk about that again more later. But that's what happened to Africa, this idea of creating these superimposed boundaries. Therefore, Africa doesn't really have nation states. It's actually the worst place in the world. If you're trying to find a nation state, good luck in Africa. Because if you tried to create boundaries that reflected the identity of the people, who do I feel like I am? This is what you'd get. Right. And, and of course, you know, there's already 55 states in Africa. Can you imagine like 555? Because <laughs> that's that's about what you would need. And, and good luck on that map quiz, by the way. All right. It's going to be hard enough. Uh, like most American kids, we don't know a lot about Africa. And, you know, we need to work on that, too. But, you know, I'll give you an example. Look at Nigeria. Essentially, Nigeria. And don't make fun of my disability. I'm going to tell you that that background color there. It might be green. It, 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 I don't know. It could be pink. It could be some sort of pastel color. But essentially, Nigeria is here, right? This is Nigeria. Is it any wonder that it's hard to keep Nigeria together, right? There's three huge ethnic groups, Hausa, Yoruba, and Igbo. And, and there's other groups as well. Uh, but that country, for most of the last 50 years, has been in constant turmoil as those groups wrestle each other for control of territory, right? And, and, you know, look, it's not hard to see why. And, and, and areas that have less division are a little bit easier to hold together, right? But this is the idea of, of the idea of a nation state and, and, the, and the struggles that, that trying to achieve a nation state create. I mean, think about here in our country, we say one nation under God, indivisible. Are we really one nation? Are we really one culturally homogeneous group of people? All right, different languages, you know, different ethnic groups, different background stories, but we buy into an idea of being an American. 
you know, it's hard to buy into being Nigerian. All right. One of the few things that they do have in common is that they're rabidly supportive of the Nigerian soccer team. All right. That's, that's the thing that brings them together like nothing else. Uh, and lately it's gotten a lot better. They've had a peaceful transition of power. They've had a political, uh, an election, a national election. Usually in Nigerian history, whenever there was an election, there, there was, there was, there was uh, you know, problems transitioning power. Uh, and, and lately it's gotten better. All right. Let's talk about boundaries, right? Let's talk about boundaries. First of all, boundaries are human creations, right? They are things that people make. So they, they don't make decisions. They, they, they don't do things on their own. They are literally lines that humans arbitrarily draw, all right, on the physical terrain of the earth. So by definition, a boundary is a vertical plane, okay? It goes down into the earth and it goes up into outer space. And that's because now we can float satellites around up there. We can drill for oil, we can dig for mines and things like that. So the boundary doesn't, doesn't just stop at the earth and it doesn't go up, it doesn't just stop at the sky. It goes all the way up into you know perpetuity up there. So when we say a boundary, it's a very precise thing. The frontier, a little more vague, a little more fuzzy because it's like a zone of transition, right? So you have a, an area on both sides of the boundary that is frontier-like. OK, kind of like when you go to Disney and it's frontier land. Well, that was the old idea that back in the you know old days of America, the, the Western territories, you know, we had this frontier with Mexico. Right. A boundary is precise. So we have different kinds of boundaries. Right. So you need to know some of these definitions and there's all over the Quizlet. A geometric boundary is a straight line. OK, lines of latitude, lines of longitude. These are lines that are surveyed. All right. There are lots of countries that have straight line boundaries, right? especially in areas that are, you know, physically deserts or underpopulated places, too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, too rocky. You just draw these straight lines, right? In the United States, we also have a lot of internal boundaries that are straight lines, right? And so, again, especially west of the Mississippi, where the terrain was flat and featureless, Congress just started drawing big rectangles out there. And there's another little part of that. Remember this all men are created equal idea. Well, if we're all men are created equal, let's start creating states that are equal. Okay. That's a uniquely American idea. And, and we've seen that historically too. You know, Tennessee and Kentucky, you know, they're not the exact same shape, but they're about the same size. And they came into the union at about the same time. Right. Alabama and Mississippi, they're almost mirror images of each other. And they came in at the same time. Right. And, and you look at the two Dakotas. They came in at exactly the same time. You know, Kansas and Nebraska. Right. Colorado and Wyoming and New Mexico and Arizona. You know, the Congress deliberately created states that were about the same with all these geometric boundaries. Right. Straight lines. Very commonly, we see what we call physical boundaries, right? And these are, you know, rivers and, and the tops of mountains and you know, other things that create an obvious distinction that this is one territory and that's another, right? So if it follows natural features, it's a physical boundary, but it can also be a cultural boundary as well. And this is where you divide a human landscape. So you might have Mexico and the United States, one Spanish speaking, one English speaking. So the boundary between them and, and, in, and in the case of the United States and Mexico, part of our boundary is geometric, part of our boundary is physical, but all of it is a cultural boundary, right? The part that's geometric is as you get out towards California, it's straight lines. As you come back towards Texas and the Gulf of Mexico, it follows the Rio Grande River, okay? And then of course, we've got boundaries that were there before people, and those are called antecedent. In this case, antes, como en español, before, right? And then you have subsequent or consequent boundaries because those are boundaries as a consequence of something else, okay? Before people, antecedent, after people, subsequent or consequent, right? So then you might have territory where uh, the territory belonging to a state is completely surrounded by territory belonging to another state. So you have what is called an enclave. An enclave has to be totally surrounded. 
if it's just a piece of territory that's separated and split off from its other territory, then that creates what we call an exclave. Now, there are exclaves that are also enclaves, right? But not every exclave is an enclave because they're not all totally surrounded, right? And there are enclaves that are exclaves, but not every enclave is an exclave because sometimes the enclave is its own state. And I'll give you a great example of that. That's like the country of Lesotho, which is totally surrounded by South Africa. And so it creates its own enclave, but it's not an exclave because it's not part of any other state. Right. But then there are exclaves. There's a piece of Russia that is not touching the rest of Russia called Kaliningrad. There's a piece of Angola that doesn't t touch the rest of Angola. It's called Cabinda, right? And theoretically, Alaska is an exclave. It doesn't touch the rest of the United States. And then kids say, what about Hawaii? Yes. And by the way, you're supposed to put the apostrophe between the eyes. Uh, but Hawaii is not really an exclave because it's not separated by land. It's separated by water, right? It's an archipelago of islands. It's not really an exclave, right? But if you need to, Go back into your Quizlet and search up these definitions, right? If you find yourself being confused by what all these words mean, right? I get it, but, you know, it's just like when you were little and you were learning your multiplication times tables, you probably sat there with a bunch of flashcards, right? So do the same thing, right? Sometimes you need to remember how to study and sometimes you might even need to learn how to study. All right. I mentioned this one earlier, the superimposed boundary. When an outside power comes in and just forcibly draws a boundary, we call that a superimposed boundary. And of course, there they might ignore the local customs, the local cultures. In Africa today, you have a big problem where, um, you know, Africa is very tribal, tribalism, where people identify. I mentioned that in Nigeria, they have the Hausa, the Yoruba, and the Igbo. Well, what if your tribe is lumped together in a state with a bunch of other tribal identities and you don't want to be together with those people? You create a multinational state that way and that can be a problem. Or your tribe might be uh, bifurcated and split and that might be a problem as well because part of your group lives in one state and part of your group lives in another. And that would create, of course, a multi-state nation. Right. So again, these are some of the connections between the vocabulary and, and these examples in the real world. And again, that's something the CED tells you is that you have to be able to define these things, but you also be able to, to identify on the map places where these things exist. One other kind of boundary, and this is the one that no longer exists, and these are called relic boundaries. Right? Like a relic is something that's ancient or some artifact like Indiana Jones finds relics. Um, and this is like, for example, the Berlin Wall. Right? You can go see where the Berlin Wall was. Today, it's a big tourist attraction, but the wall is no longer there. Um, or you might see, for example, uh, a relic boundary in Europe where the Schengen Agreement now permits the free movement of labor and, and many European countries have stopped enforcing or administering their borders. You know, they're, they're, they're really now, um, you know, pretty open in, in terms of people coming across. Now, in the era of COVID, in the era of terrorism, the modern day, there is some debate. Do we need to go back and do we need to start administering our borders? Do we need to start controlling who comes and goes and who crosses? That is something that is now currently being debated again for the first time in a few decades uh, in, in that area of the world. All right, so this is just a schematic diagram showing you that the boundary goes down into the earth, goes up into the airspace and those kinds of things. Um, obviously, you know, the United States is, is was one of the first countries to be able to just throw satellites up there. Um, obviously, the Russians put the first one up there, Sputnik. Um, but today, you know, the United States has, has enjoyed pretty much dominance in space for many, many years. And, and we could just fly over other countries and take pictures from outer space. But... Nowadays, China is starting to launch a lot of satellites up there. And, and now there's, again, a debate about this. Who really has the rights to fly over somebody else's airspace? And uh, countries can defend their airspace. There are tragic times where planes are sometimes shot down. Sometimes even passenger planes can get shot down flying over another country's airspace if they are misidentified or if they are mistakenly uh, thought to be, uh, you know, a military aircraft rather than a commercial jet liner. 
Um, so you can look up some of those episodes as well. Uh, but this is what I meant by, you know, the boundary being a vertical plane. Now, these boundary disputes are because the boundaries basically go through a series of stages of boundary creation. First, you have to define the boundary. You have to legally describe it, right? The boundary is going to be the deepest part of the river. And they call that the foul wag, if you want to look that word up. Um, but you have to agree. The boundary has to be agreed upon by the parties. Uh, in your neighborhood, your property has a legal definition, right? They come out and they survey it. And in your homeowner's documents, in your mortgage documents, there'll be a little paragraph and it'll spell out the legal definition of your property. Well, then you have to delimit it. You have to draw it on a survey, put it on a map. And, and this is where countries can sometimes play games because a map made by one country, they might just start drawing the boundary and saying, oh, yep, that's our territory over there. And the other country's like, what are you talking about? Man? That's, that's been our territory and we agreed a long time ago. And now suddenly you're making a map and you're saying that it's yours and it creates conflict. Well, then you might actually demarcate the boundary. You might actually build some sort of barrier, some wall. And, and you say, okay, this is our territory and you can't come in. And of course, as soon as you build a wall, right, what do some people say? Oh, well, um, I'm going to get over it. I'm going to go under it. I'm going to go around it or through it, or somehow I'm going to defeat this wall. And, and, you know, listen, lots of countries have built walls in the past. We had a famous essay question on the exam and it wanted to know a wall in the modern day. Number one answer the kids gave us was the Great Wall of China. I'm sorry, Mulan, but that was 2000 years ago. So you'd have to really carefully read the question and make sure you pay attention to the time frame that they're making you talk about. All right. And then, of course, I mentioned you have to administer the boundary or not, depending on whether or not you want to police it, depending on whether or not you want it to be under your control. So after these boundaries go through these stages, sometimes there can be problems. There could be a dispute over where the boundary should be. We agreed the boundary would be at the deepest part of the river, but there was an earthquake and the river moved. So now the boundary is over there. That does happen in the real world. Um, locational disputes. They're not arguing what they agreed. They're arguing where it actually is. We said it was going to be the tallest mountain. Well, that's not the tallest mountain. This is the tallest mountain. So now you're arguing about where the boundary actually goes. And then there's the operational problem. And that is, again, hey, We've got a boundary here, but every day these people try to hop over the fence and they try to run in. That's an operational problem. Now, again, we're not the only country in the world. Every single rich country in the world tries to keep poor people out, right? Uh, the European Union does it. Uh, the United States does it. Mexico does it on their southern border with all the countries from Central America, right? And so you sometimes have these operational disputes. And then there could be an allocational dispute where the boundary uh, separates some sort of resource. In this case, a lot of times you'll see this in the Middle East with oil. Of all the boundary types, though, the one that generally creates the most problems are those superimposed boundaries that I mentioned before, especially like the ones that white Europeans drew in Africa. And, and especially when it creates conflict over these you know, territorial tribal disputes these historical lands that are now in somebody else's sovereign uh, jurisdiction. And, and it can sometimes even create what we call landlocked states. And, and that's probably behind this little thing here. Uh, let me see if I can make this go away. There we go. How about that? Woo! Just slide it over. Landlocked states are the ones that don't have access to the sea. Now be careful. Don't say landlocked states don't have access to water. They might be on a lake. They might have a river. It's not water. It's the open sea. It's the ocean that they don't have access to. And of course, that is a really big problem in today's global economy, where 70% of the earth is covered by the oceans. And, and there's so much global trade on these ginormous container ships right, that move all over the earth. Um, and if you don't have access to the ocean, then you are utterly dependent on uh, whichever state's do touch the ocean and, and that are adjacent to your territory, you're, you're, you're hoping that they permit uh, the, free flu, the free flow of goods and services into your state. Uh, and that's, you know, like I mentioned, Lesotho, utterly dependent on South Africa. And, and by the way, Africa has the most number 
of landlocked states in the world. North America has none. Not one North American country uh, is, is restricted. South America has two, right? Bolivia, famously, they fought a war with their neighbors, Chile and Peru, and they lost that war. And their territory, their, their, their coastline was taken away from them. When you lose a war, you lose land. Uh, even still today, though, Bolivia, you know, oh, we're still going to have a Navy. And they have like two little boats on Lake Titicaca and they drive around with their uniforms on and, you know, they pretend like they're a Navy. And, and so Bolivia and Paraguay are the two in South America. Europe has a, a, a few, uh, Switzerland, for example, Austria, for example, the, you know, those countries don't touch the ocean. Asia has some as well. In fact, Asia has some that are doubly landlocked, meaning that it's landlocked and all the countries that touch it are also landlocked. And that's when you're really, really uh, disadvantaged when you're, when you're doubly landlocked. See if you can find that one. All right, so when we go to this, this map of Africa, and you can certainly see here, uh, Rwanda and Burundi, right? No access to the ocean. Now they do have access to water, right? Uh, but Tanzania touches the ocean. Mozambique touches the ocean. Malawi does not, right? Zimbabwe does not. Zambia does not. Um, if you look at Namibia, there's an interesting story here. They've got the coastline, but they also wanted access to the Zambezi River. So they created this tiny little extension, this little corruption of, of territory that basically is like a finger sticking out there to touch the Zambezi River so that they would have access to it. Uh, I mentioned earlier that piece of Angola that's an exclave. This is Cabinda here. It doesn't touch the rest of Angola, but it's not an enclave because it's not totally surrounded, right? Meanwhile, Lesotho is. It's totally surrounded by South Africa, but it's not an exclave because it's not part of some other state. And people sometimes will look at Swaziland and say, oh, is that an enclave too? No, because it touches two countries. It touches Mozambique. It touches South Africa. Uh, that country, by the way, has also changed its name in the recent past. Uh, the king of Swaziland, he did not want his country to be confused with Switzerland. And so he decided to rename it Iswatini. And so now you'll usually see it listed as Iswatini. The color coding here is the colonialism that we also need to know about in this unit. And we talked about colonialism a lot in unit three, because that's the spread of English, but also French, Portuguese. And, and in this case, some of these were French possessions. Some of them were Portuguese possessions. Some of them even were Belgian. The Democratic Republic of Congo was Belgian. Um, tiny little European country controlling huge areas of Africa. And that just told, told you the disparity of power in that time frame of the world. And it's no wonder that this area of sub-Saharan Africa is economically less developed as maybe some other parts of the world. So I mentioned about the question on the exam years ago about the wall. And, you know, certainly the Great Wall is very famous historically. Um, there is a demilitarized zone that still exists between the two Koreas, um, and it is heavily fortified on both sides. Every once in a while, you'll see some, you know, example of um, uh, the wall not being so enforced. Uh, President Trump met uh, with Kim Jong-un, uh, the leader of North Korea, famously at the demilitarized zone. So every once in a while, you'll see that that DMZ gets into the news, but it basically splits the two Koreas. There is a wall in Israel that, se that separates within the city of Jerusalem um, and within Israeli and Palestinian neighborhoods. Some uh, Israeli neighborhoods are actually in uh, the occupied territories of the West Bank. That's a big source of, uh, of friction there. But again, this boundary here, this, this markation, demarcation of the boundary uh, can be seen. Right? It's a physical marking of the boundary. And certainly we know that in the United States lately, there has been a vigorous debate about strengthening border security in the United States. Um, the idea of building a wall, there's been a wall, fence. there's been a fence for a long time. It has not always been operationally secure, but we've had a wall for quite a while. It goes from the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific Ocean and south of San Diego in California. You can see it, it's physically there. Um, there's actually a, a really cool place, Mexicali and Calexico, 
Calexico is on the U.S. side. Mexicali is on the Mexican side. It is one urban area with a wall that runs through it. There's the Ciudad Juarez on the Mexican side um, uh, of El Paso, which is in Texas. There's Laredo, Texas, and Nuevo Laredo in Mexico. Uh, there's a bunch of these places that just are right on the border. And again, there's a wall that runs through it. Again, walls are ugly, right? The Berlin Wall became a source of, you know, graffiti and, and it became a source of, um, you know, just it was a symbol of oppression. Uh, walls restrict trade. You know, sometimes that's the purpose of the wall. Uh, they want to stop illegal trade. Uh, but obviously walls, the big reason is they want to stop migration. Um, but sometimes families get split and people can be on wrong sides of the border. And sometimes people get, you know, shot and killed in Germany trying to get out of East Berlin and trying to escape into freedom. Um, the walls have negative environmental consequences, right? It interrupts the, the migratory uh, paths of animals and things like that. So, you know, again, people are going to try and defeat the wall. I mean, it's not like the wall is going to be 100% efficacious. Typically, the legal system is more effective at, at stopping the migration than just building a physical structure. And of course, sometimes walls get torn down, right? The Berlin Wall famously came down in the late 80s. And, um, you know, that was sometime, you know, in my life when I was uh, in college still. And I just remember watching just, you know, with shock, you know, that this symbol of the East and the West and the Cold War behind the Iron Curtain, behind the Berlin Wall, um, back in the USSR, you know, this idea. Um, and to see that wall come down kind of live on TV was just, you know, incredible, incredible to see. Uh, but now the Schengen Agreement, again, ultimately has permitted the movement of labor around Europe. And, you know, not all parts of Europe are enjoying the, the Schengen area. Um, but we'll talk about that again in, in a little bit later in a different topic. Uh, when we took kids to China uh, on one of our spring break trips, we actually went up to Badaling, uh, which is north of the capital city of Beijing. And it's the most accessible part of the wall for tourists. And, you know, we took the kids up to the wall. It was really, really cool. Um, and um, I remember some of my students said, Mr. Turner, can we hike up to that, that, that guard post? Wait, you know, and, and it was like, it looked like it was close. <laughs> and so we started going and climbing these steps and, you know, I'm exhausted. And this was, you know, 2006. This was a younger, fitter version of Spatial Shark. And we, we took forever to get there. And then I turned around, and I looked back and I'm like, oh my God, how are we going to get back? Because it was steep and it, it's treacherous and it's not exactly an easy uh, hike for most people. Um, and so, you know, it, it took us way longer and we blew our time allotment. And, you know, our, our guide Ming was very upset with us because we were not prompt. Um, you know, he wanted us to be on time. And but anyway, the Great Wall was such a cool thing. I remember walking on the Great Wall thinking my shoes are made in China. And, and, and I don't know why, but it just suddenly hit me that my shoes had come home. They, they were back where they came from. And I just, I thought that was cool. I called my wife from the Great Wall of China. She reminded me that it's a 13 hour time difference and that it was indeed the middle of the night. And she was not very impressed that I was on the Great Wall. Uh, and, and then we bought t-shirts on the Great Wall. And um, you, you never buy anything in China and pay the price they tell you. It's all about haggling. And this lady wanted me to pay it like 10 yuan for one shirt. And it was like seven yuan to the dollar. So it was like a dollar. I mean, it was still cheap, but we basically bargained and haggled. And I ended up buying everybody on the trip a shirt for 70 yuan. So for $10, we bought like 30 shirts. So they were like 30 cents a piece. Um, I'm embarrassed to tell you that in China, apparently uh, I am a 5XL. Uh, so <laughs> it's not even just the 2XL, 5XL. Uh, if you are a slightly overweight American in China. All right, this is that wall I mentioned in Israel. Um, and, and, you know, you can see, you know, very, very demarcated separation, right, in, in those neighborhoods there. All right. Um, in the Arabian Peninsula, there are some places that the boundary is not even really agreed upon because it's out in what they call that empty quarter where it's just literally nothing but sand out there. And so there is no uh, real definition. Uh, and sometimes on a map, you'll see these dotted lines. And what that means is they cannot agree on where the border is. 
Egypt and Sudan have that problem. Until recently, there were some areas between India, Pakistan, China, Bangladesh that could not be agreed. And there are boundary commissions that work on those problems. All right, boundaries in the water. Remember I mentioned that we don't just have problems on land. We sometimes have boundaries in the waterways of the world. Um, sometimes there are places that create choke points. And these are areas of really narrow um, waterways or passageways, oftentimes called straits, like the Strait of Gibraltar that goes between Africa and Europe. Um, the Strait of Hormuz, which is between um, Iran and the states of the Arabian Peninsula, Oman, the United Arab Emirates, all right, the, the, the waterway gets really narrow there. 25% of the world's oil comes out through that strait. So it's very strategic, very important. Um, in fact, I probably can go back here for a second. There is that Strait of, strait of Hormuz is right here. Again, where Oman has a little exclave, not an enclave because it's not surrounded, but a little exclave of Oman. And, and the ships have to go very, very slowly through here. Um, it's, it's only a few kilometers wide. And Iran in the last few years has been uh, stopping ships that they you know, just arbitrarily decide, yeah, we're going to take your ship and we're going to kind of keep it hostage there. And a lot of countries of the world have been getting very upset with Iran about that. Um, but that is a very, very obvious choke point. There's also one down by Singapore. It's called the Strait of Malacca, which is a very narrow body of water between Malaysia and Indonesia. So water is important not just because of the fishing and but but the free flow of goods on on ships on on you know big uh tankers for oil but also big container ships for all the products that we buy in the global economy so um the united nations took it upon themselves to talk about how are we going to allow countries to defend their territorial integrity because in today's modern world you know, people have vast naval power. So countries wanted to defend. This is why in the olden days, countries built forts up and down their coastline. And, and you basically could defend as far as you could shoot a cannonball. All right. That's how far your territory extended. But as the technology got better and better and better, there were places in the world where ships could not go freely. So the UN knew that they needed to come up with some consensus. They had to go get some kind of an agreement that all countries would follow that would set out territorial water, meaning this is an extension of my sovereignty. I control everything that happens in this water. You sail in here, I can board your ship, I can, I can inspect it, I can take it. If I want, you're in my water, it's my sovereign territory. That's territorial sea. Then they had a contiguous zone, and contiguous means it touches. And so basically that was like an extension of your territorial sea. So like if the US Coast Guard was chasing some drug boat that was trying to take, you know, cocaine into the United States illegally and they started running from the Coast Guard, when they get out into international waters, it's like, ah, we, we got away. Well, the territorial sea is backed up by a contiguous zone that you can extend your chase, basically. And then they have what they call the exclusive economic zone, the EEZ, that is not sovereign, but it is area that you control the economic activities. So like fishing, drilling for oil, you might make people pay you a fee, you might collect a percentage of what they earn, that kind of thing. So when you look here, and I'll give you a chance to read down through this, all right, territorial sea, exclusive economic zone, make sure you can define these things, make sure you can mentally think about what they look like, and I'll show you some pictures, Right, but this is something that would make a great essay on the AP Human Geography exam. This would be a great FRQ, defining, right, identifying, describing, explaining, explaining the degree to which, right, this is all kind of important here. I'll give you a second to look through the slide. All right, down at the bottom, what do we do if there's not enough water to give each country 12 miles or to give each country 200 miles? What if, the, what if the choke point is too narrow? So then we follow what we call the median line principle. And remember, median is the midpoint. 
It's not the mean. It's not the mode. Right? It's not those averages. It's the median. It's the middle. And, and therefore, we're going to cut it in half. This doesn't always solve the problem. There's one big issue in the world right now. I'm going to show you a picture of it in just a second, where the, the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, has not solved the problem. Now, there's another one down there. I, I put the East Las Malvinas. This is where Argentina got really, uh, you know, uh, aggressive. And in the 1980s, when they had some economic problems in Argentina, they said, you know what? The Falkland Islands out there, they're close to Argentina. We're just going to claim them. We're going to take them. Now, there's more penguins there than there are people. But the Argentinian military just showed up one day and they said, yep, stick their flag in the ground. This is Argentina now. Las Islas son nuestras, right? They're, the islands are ours. And the British are like, what? <laughs> because they've been under British control for 300 years. And I think the Argentinians, they just thought the British wouldn't care. And they were like, okay, whatever. It's far away. And it's, you know, just two dumb rocks and we don't care. Well, guess what? The British did care. This was Margaret Thatcher in the 80s in Great Britain. And she got on the phone to kind of Ronald Reagan. She said, okay, hey, Ronnie, we're going to go down there and we're going we're gonna to kick some butt. And so the entire British military went down there and, you know, spanked Argentina kind of hard. And Argentina hasn't forgotten this, by the way. There's memorials all over Argentina to the people who were lost in the, in the, in the Falklands War. Don't call them the Falkland. If you go to Argentina, you call them the Falkland Islands, you'll get punched in the mouth. Uh, they're still referred to as Las Islas Malvinas. And um, Argentina's soccer team actually got in trouble because you're not supposed to do politics in FIFA. And they had a big sign in front of their team on one of their games. And it said, Las, Las Islas son nuestras, right? The Malvinas are ours. And uh, they, they got a little bit of a punishment for that. Uh, but the bigger issue is the South China Sea. And I'll show you this in a sec. First, a little bit of a schematic, right? Where's the land? Where's the territorial sea? Where's the exclusive economic zone? That kind of thing. Watch one thing real quick. Where the land is interrupted by internal water, um, that is your sovereign territory because you draw basically a, a dotted line and, and your sovereignty just kind of extends along the dotted line. Where does this matter to us? The intracoastal waterway. Now be careful. I hear people all the time say the intercoastal. It's not inter, it's intra, it's within. It's within our sovereign territory. It's not between, international. Inter means between. Intra means within. It's the intra-coastal waterway. And, and, and Lake Boca is a good example of that. And some of you sometimes go out with your little rubber boats and you, you know, go uh, inner tubing and things like that. You go ski behind boats on Lake Boca on the weekends. Intra-coastal waterway. All right. Here's a great map showing you a real world example of these uh, territorial seas, as well as these uh, exclusive economic zones or EEZs. And this is using Australia as an example. Um, and so notice that Australia does extend their sovereignty and they claim part of Antarctica. Lots of countries do. There is an international agreement, however, that Antarctica will only be for scientific research. You cannot mine anything in Antarctica. You're not trying to get minerals out. Antarctica cannot be used for defense or for military reasons. It's only for scientific purposes. But all of the countries down in that southern cone area, they do have their own claims on Antarctica. And, and same thing, by the way, happens up at the North Pole. There are countries that belong to what we call the Arctic Council. The United States is a member of that because... Obviously, Alaska touches up there in the Arctic Circle, Russia, Norway, uh, Greenland. Um, those are all members of that Arctic Council. Okay, Iceland, right, where we're going to be going in 2023. All right, so this is the one I was telling you about, and this is the South China Sea. This has never been on the AP exam. I think it's a huge possibility as an FRQ. Okay, so. China is up there at the top of your map. The little island here that sticks down, this is what we call Taiwan. China does not exist. China does not think that Taiwan has a right to sovereignty. Uh, Taiwan has not declared independence, 
but they don't want to be part of China. They would like regional autonomy. Uh, China has said that if Taiwan ever tries to break away, that they will physically attack it and make it part of China again. Um, that 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 in itself is a bit of a problem. There is a choke point between Taiwan and China, uh, the Formosa Strait. Uh, the United States regularly sails military ships through there just to basically, you know, stick it to China and say, hey, <laughs> this is the open water. You don't you don't control this. And China gets really upset every time it happens. Uh, just a few weeks ago, China was flying fighter jets and bombers over Taiwan, basically just to tell them, hey, guess what? You know, you're still part of China and you know, there's a conflict coming there. Um, but in the South China Sea, you have a lot of other literal states. And I don't mean literal as in figuratively and literally. I mean, L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L, -T -T literal means a country that borders the water. And so the Philippines are a literal state. Um, Malaysia is a literal state. Indonesia, Vietnam, um, even little teeny tiny Brunei, the Sultanate of Brunei is a literal state. It's a sovereign state that is, you know, used to be part of Malaysia, but they wanted to be their own little entity. So they are. Um, all of these countries claim some access into the South China Sea. But here's where China comes in and says, uh, 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 before you people were all countries in the ancient world, China owned all of this water. And so they say, no, no, it's always Chinese. It's been China. After all, it's the South China Sea. And do you know the other countries, they won't refer to it as the South China Sea. Because if you call it the South China Sea, you're basically admitting that it belongs to China, right? So they, they no, nope. Vietnam calls it the East Sea because it's to the east of Vietnam. Right. Just like Korea, South Korea will not call it the Sea of Japan right? because it's not Japanese. So there's all these places in the world where we're fighting over access to the ocean. And in this case, it's because of the Spratly Islands. They are basically these insignificant little rocks, except there's oil and there's natural gas, a lot of it. And it's so important that the Philippines and Malaysia and, 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 and Indonesia, they all want a piece of it. But China's like, nope, it's all ours. It's all Chinese. And let's be honest, what is the Philippines going to do when China, you know, comes in here with, you know, 1.3 billion people and a massively big military? So, but remember the Philippines used to be part of the United States until 1947, they were American territory. Right? We gave them their independence after World War II. So we still have a massive naval base in the Philippines. And the United States has more aircraft carriers than everybody else in the world combined. And we're the country of freedom and saying, uh-uh, you can't just take all of this. Because China wants to make the South China Sea and say, ah, nobody else can come in here. It's all Chinese water. And the United States is like, no, it's not. And so we literally have one aircraft carrier battle group constantly stationed right there in the world. And we have another one off the coast of Japan in Yokohama is their home port. We have like 13 aircraft carrier battle groups. And basically the United States is the world's, you know, big military superpower. China has two aircraft carriers. They're currently trying to build more. So there could be another arms race going on here in this part of the world. The British just built their first new aircraft carrier in you know half a century and do you know where they sent that aircraft carrier first to the south china sea that was the first place they sent it remember that the british used to own hong kong the british used to own singapore which is at the tip of that Malay peninsula right there so the british are our big buddies right so they're gonna send their aircraft carrier to kind of help the americans out and we just signed a big deal with australia just below this map where Australia is now going to get nuclear powered submarines from the United States because there's a conflict coming. And this is an area of the world where that water is extremely valuable, but the, the, the resources in the water are what is really valuable in the South China Sea, in the Spratly Islands. That Strait of Malacca I mentioned is right here, right? And then again, at the tip of that Malay Peninsula is where Singapore is located. So if you ever see this issue about the South China Sea, this is what they're talking about. Now, here's what China's been doing lately. They take some of these islands that are little more 
than just random rocks. Uh, now, you have to understand, when you think about a reef, that's always underwater, okay? Right? When I go snorkeling or scuba diving, I, I've been scuba diving one time in my entire life. It was in Australia, and, and we, we took kids there on a spring break trip, and, and it was on the Great Barrier Reef. That's pretty cool, right? It's the only, I, I will probably never go scuba diving ever again, but I hit the home run the first time. So a reef is underwater. A shoal is sometimes underwater and sometimes above the water, depending on the tides, okay? And then an island is always above the water, okay? Now, in the, in the era of global warming and, and climate change, there are some places like the Maldives that look a bit like this and they're under threat of ending up under the water. That's a different story. We'll talk about that when we get to the you know, chapter on environment at the end. But what China's been doing is they're going to these kinds of places where there's reefs and shoals and they're dumping a bunch of dirt and, and rock and coral and sand and everything. And they're building, this is not fake. This is one of those islands in the South China Sea where the Chinese are saying, oh, we're going to build a, we're going to build a military base here and we're going to turn this into a Chinese outpost. And once we have military control, we're going to claim territorial and exclusive economic zone because this is part of China. And the rest of the world is like, how do, how do we stop this? How do we prevent this? Right? Who's going to gang up together and, and say, hey, China, you, you can't do this. But it's happening all over the South China Sea. Right? And, and China, again, they claim historically they have what they call the nine dash line. Now, this is way more than nine dashes. But it looks, do you see this almost looks like, ah, it looks like a tongue, right? That tongue is what China claims is Chinese. Anything in that tongue, don't come at us, bro, right? Because, you know, we're, we're China. Again, the only country that so far has been able to say, oh, yeah, you're China. But guess what? We're the United States, right? And we have 13 aircraft carriers and you have two. And so we have more, right? We win for now. China is trying to catch up. All right. Shapes of states. I'll let you take a look at this. There's a great little part of the AMSCO book where they talk about the different shapes of states, what they call territorial morphology, and think about control over territory. What does it mean if a state is elongated? Maybe it might be hard for the people in the northern part to communicate with the people in the southern part. What does it mean if it's fragmented? You know, if a state is physically broken up, maybe it's easier to politically break up, right? So I'll give you a chance. Make sure you know the definitions of these different state shapes. All right. Remember I talked about enclaves and exclaves? There's Lesotho again, right? It's perforated, all right? Actually, South Africa is the one that's perforated. Perforated means it has a hole in it. And, and so Lesotho perforates. Uh, South Africa. Uh, protruded or corrupted means something sticks out. That's like Florida, right? It's a peninsula. It sticks out of the United States. Compact, nice and small, right? That's like Hungary. So what are some of these forces? Now, we've already talked about these in Unit 3, so I'm not going to spend a long time in this video talking about centripetal and centrifugal forces. But I do need you to know the definitions. And I also need you to be able to identify examples and be able to talk about these things. You know, define, identify, describe, explain, and compare. Compare would be a great word with these kinds of things. So what are the forces of fragmentation, forces of division, centrifugal forces, different languages, different ethnicities, different language groups, uh, different tribal identities, all of these kinds of things, unequal distribution of wealth, um, you know, even territorial morphology. This is when a state struggles to hold itself together. In an extreme case, the, the state could break up Sudan and South Sudan, right? Uh, now there's two Koreas. Right. Uh, we're, we're seeing that Somalia might break into multiple pieces. There is some degree of, of what if that India could break up. And, and, and sometimes countries create a federal framework to give these different parts of the state some regional autonomy, hoping that they won't, you know, then try to break up, that they'll be appeased by you know, giving them some degree of local control. 
But these are the forces of division, the forces of separation. All right. And we talk about separatism, right? We talk about ethno-nationalism. And, and this is like in Spain, you know, I, I don't feel Spanish. I feel Catalan, right? Uh, that's ethno-nationalistic. And sometimes there can be, you know, terrorist acts. They blow things up. They attack leaders of a political party that represents national identity rather than sub-national identity, right? This is like Quebecois, you know, Quebec voted uh, very narrowly. They voted to stay part of Canada in the 1990s. Scotland recently had a referendum where they voted about whether they should stay as part of the United Kingdom or not. So these are good examples, these ideas of centrifugal forces. Then on the other side, remember compare similarities and differences, we talk about centripetal forces. And these are the forces of cohesion, forces of unity, forces of togetherness. Now, it's many of the exact same things that you saw on the other slide, right? And if you want, you can pause and you can go back and forth between the two. It's the same kind of things. It's just that when you're all together, it's, it's centripetal. And when you're different, it's centrifugal. And there was a great essay years ago where it showed South Asia as a region, but it didn't name any of the countries. You had to know that it was India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. And you had to talk about what are some of the centripetal and centrifugal forces. And you could only pick each country one time and you could only use the same force one time. So you couldn't say that language holds India together and say, oh, English and Hindi. And then you couldn't then turn around and go, oh, but India has a lot of different languages and that splits them up. That's true, but they wouldn't let you argue both sides. You had to come up with a different force or you had to talk about a different country. And just so you know, Pakistan doesn't have one national language. There's people that speak Urdu. And then there are people in Pakistan that don't speak Urdu. Right. And then you got Bangladesh that used to be East Pakistan and they didn't want to be Pakistani. Right. They are Muslim, but they're not Urdu speakers. They're Bengali speakers. And so in 1971, they broke away and they had to fight uh, a conflict against Pakistan to break away and become Bangladesh. And of course, India, and Pakistan, they don't love each other. Right. When the British left, they thought it was just going to be one political entity, but it broke and it split into a mostly Hindu India and a mostly Muslim Pakistan. But when Bangladesh wanted to break away, India is like, oh, oh, so you're going to fight Pakistan? We'll help, right? Not because they love Bangladesh, but because they hate Pakistan, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, well, let's fight Pakistan too. Let's take an opportunity. Um, and, and now there's you know struggles between India and Bangladesh, especially with water, because Bangladesh gets the water last and so India has been building these hydroelectric dams uh, before the water gets into Bangladesh. And during the rainy season, they open the dams up and they let Bangladesh flood. And during the dry season, they, <laughs> and they turn the water off and they keep all the water in India. And then the Bengali farmers don't have any water to irrigate their crops. There's all kinds of these conflicts, these allocational and operational issues, right? So we know that sometimes a country can use a federal system like we do in the United States to give Mississippi and, and, and Montana the ability to make different decisions. You know, not every state is going to, you know, want the same things within a federal framework. Um, you know, marijuana laws, gun control laws, gay marriage laws, you name it. There's a lot of these political cleavages, you know, that separate, uh, you know, Americans. Uh, and, and other countries have adopted these federal frameworks, too. We're going to talk about that in a second. But all, sometimes countries can move their capital city to kind of create a force of cohesion. Um, and, and for example, uh, Brazil moving their capital from Rio de Janeiro to Brasilia. Um, in, um, in, in Indonesia, they're talking about moving the capital away from Jakarta. Um, already in Malaysia, they've, they've been talking about moving the capital away from Kuala Lumpur and trying to put it in a place that's more centrally located, that's more, um, you know, um, more uh, convenient or more representative of the national identity as opposed to a, um, you know, a regional identity. Another great example was in um, uh, Nigeria. 
they the old capital of Lagos, right, was on the coast, uh, an old colonial city, and they wanted to move to the new uh, capital of Abuja, which is in the center of the country. All right, and again, forces of cohesion can be educational things like the Pledge of Allegiance and teaching that your country is, you know, ethnocentric. We're the best, right? No, we're 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 going to tell you how great our country is. Now, we talked about forms of governance. Um, sometimes countries can be unitary, meaning that there's only one level of government. It does not have to be a dictatorship. Is a big misconception kids have because they hear unitary and they think, oh, one ruler, that's a dictator. It can be a dictatorship, but it can also be a democracy. All that means is that there's only a national level of government and then a local level. There's nothing in between. Now, that's not like the United States. We don't have a unitary system. We have a federal system where there is a national government and there is local government. And then in between, there is an extra layer of regional governance. And that is our 50 states, right? And so the opposite of unitary is actually not federalism. The opposite of unitary is confederal, which we had the Con Articles of Confederation. We also had the Confederate States of America. Ironically, the Southerners chose the same sucky government that didn't work in the early days of the United States. Gee, I wonder why the, the South lost. Uh, you know, they, they just didn't have a very effective system of governance. The unitary system, it has some advantages. You can make quick decisions, right? Everybody's on the same page, but it can also be a problem. If you live in a country that's culturally plural and you're the minority, and the unitary system is saying, hey, everybody's going to be on the same page. You're like, oh, wait a second here. I, I, I don't want to be like everybody else. I'm different. My language is different. My religion is different. So you have to think about when you have a homogeneous population and when you have a relatively small country, a unitary system is perfectly fine. Japan is unitary. OK, when you have a big country that is ethnically plural, like a Canada, right, like a Brazil, like an India, right, like an Australia, a Russia, a United States. Those are federal systems, right? Even in, even in Europe, there are some federal systems. Germany is federal. Their abbreviation, FRG, Federal Republic of Germany. And, and what's interesting is that the UK and Spain have been flirting with the idea of federalism because you could see it in the UK where they would say, oh, well, let's have England, Scotland, Wales, and let's have their own kind of governments so far, they really haven't gone that far. Spain's gone a little bit farther with giving regional autonomy to Catalonia, giving regional autonomy to the Basque country, giving regional autonomy really to all the different parts of Spain. But it's not yet a federal system. It's still a unitary system. There's not a regional level of governance. So again, what's the advantage of the federal system? You embrace the, 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 the minorities, but what's one of your problems? It can create the very division you're trying to prevent when you create the federal system, it's almost like, oh, well, you've already drawn the lines. We'll just go ahead and separate and create our own country. So, you know, there's pros and cons to all of these things. So take a look at this. I, I love this little schematic. We have one U.S. government, Washington, D.C., President Biden, right? It's the Congress, that, that the Supreme Court, that, that's the one federal government. But then you've got another layer, the 50 state governments. Right. We have a capital in Tallahassee. We have a governor DeSantis. We have a Florida legislature. We have a Florida Supreme Court. And Florida can't tell Alabama what to do. But the government of the United States can because that's a higher level government. The 50 states are in the middle of the federal system and then the local government, your mayor, right, your county commissioners, your school board. Right. The Boca uh, Beach and Parks District, the South Florida Water Management District. Right. Those are local entities. And, and, and stop and think. You don't want the president to have to fix potholes, you know, on Glades Road. And, and, and at the same time, you don't want the mayor of Boca trying to deal with, you know, a climate change agreement with all the other countries of the world. Let's let the mayor handle the potholes and let's let the, the U.S. Congress handle, you know, conflicts with, you know, uh, you know, enemy states that, that are, you know, trying to take away territory or whatever. 
there's a level of government, right? And, and in the United States, we have that federal system where we have three layers, national, right, regional, and local, as opposed to a unitary system. All you have is local and national. There's nothing in between. Okay, supranationalism, this is when three or more countries work together for some sort of uh, goal. Typically, we're talking about economic reasons. It could be defense, it could be military, could be cultural, could be environmental, could be anything, but it's usually economic. Um, whenever you join a group, you have to give up some of your sovereignty. I don't care if you're joining the soccer team, you know, if practice is from 3.30 to 5.30 and you're not there, that's a problem, right? So when you join a group, it's no longer just about you. Now you are part of the group. And sometimes the group makes a decision that you have to go along with. You don't want to be part of the group, right? Well, then you also don't get the benefits of being in the group. That's supranationalism, okay? So you talk about free trade zones, right? The old NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. During the Trump years, uh, they renegotiated um, and they created what now is called the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement. It is essentially NAFTA 2.0. It, it, it basically removes trade restrictions between the member states. It does not go as far as what the EU does. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but those are economic arrangements, right? Um, the African Union is very cultural. Right. Preserving, you know, in, in a decolonialism world where the Europeans are mostly gone. Africa has been independent. Most of the African countries have been independent since the 1960s. The African Union was promoted to preserve and to restore African identities to African countries. The Arctic Council, I mentioned earlier, very environmental. Um, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Right. Um, you know, these are all great examples. NATO is a military one. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization during the Cold War. You know, the Soviet Union was a military threat. So all of Western Europe said and, and the U.S. and Canada joined in and said, OK, if, if the Russians attack, we'll all fight together. That was the idea right, of that. And, and now NATO has to kind of reinvent itself because there is no more Soviet Union. So now NATO does more of an anti-terrorism kind of a role, more so than a, than a Cold War, bipolar, you know, us versus them kind of a mentality. There are also what we call NGOs. These are non-governmental organizations. Um, therefore, they sometimes can be a lot more effective because government is always bogged down by people arguing and different political parties and we don't have enough votes and you know, we got to we got to take it to court and everything. The NGO can do whatever they want. They're not a governmental organization. Uh, sometimes we think of these as charities, but you donate your money directly to the Red Cross and the Red Cross can send that money directly to Haiti and help out earthquake victims. Right. A lot better than a government in many ways. But of course, you lose government oversight. You lose government control. And therefore, when you give your money to the non-governmental organization, you hope that they're doing with your money what, what you thought they were going to be doing when you give them the money. You know, medicine sends frontiers, right? Doctors without borders, right? In a global pandemic world, you know, sometimes one country can't handle this by themselves. And so it's a supranational effort, right? To, to work towards solving these problems. Of course, the best example is the UN, right? The United Nations. And they have a bunch of sub-agencies, UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And we talked about that in Unit 2 because they deal with refugee crises all over the world. All right? If the Rohingya are fleeing out of Myanmar, Myanmar is not going to do anything to help them. And Bangladesh doesn't want them. So who's going to step in and help out? That needs to be a supranational effort. OK. Now, I mentioned the European Union. There's a long story here. It goes all the way back to you know, right after World War II. Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, Benelux, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg created a little trade agreement. And they were like, look, we're three tiny countries. Let's work together to fight, you know, the powers of France and Germany because, you know, they have a big economy. We don't. We'll work together. Well, it worked really well. Because France and Germany were like, hey, can we be part of your club too? And so then it started to grow. 
and then the common market. And then by the eighties, there were like 12 members. And then in the early nineties, they said, Hey, let's really make this a big deal. Let's create the European union. Right. And now they have their own flag. It's the circle of stars. And they said, okay, we're dropping all this economic stuff. We're really going to go full on into an agreement to restrict some of our own sovereignty, take away some of our borders. That's the Schengen agreement, create a common currency. They created the Euro and, and now there is a Euro zone where you use a common currency. No more Spanish pesetas, no more French francs, no more German marks, no more, um, you know, Italian, um, Oh my God, what was Italy's currency? Oh my God, I can't even remember, right? But all of them had their different currencies, Italian lira, that's what it was. And when I went to Europe as a teenager, you had to convert money like 12 times and you had to pay fees and it was always confusing and, you know, which, which currency are we using in this country? Now it's just all the same. Think about for businesses, all their accounting divisions used to have to always compute the different currency, not anymore. It's cheaper, it's more efficient, it's great for business, but you lose some of your identity. You lose, you know, instead of being Spanish or Italian or French or German, you're European now. And you know who never really wanted to buy into that was the British, right? Especially the English within Great Britain, because they never really liked it. I mean, we're on an island, we're different, we're separate. We don't want those European things. They never accepted the Euro currency. They always kept the British pound. They never, ever, ever took the new currency. And, and, and it's almost like, yeah, I'll marry you, but I'm, I'm going to live in my own house. I'm going to have my own bank account. Well, are you really married? <laughs> it's like, are you, are you really in a relationship? And so famously in 2016, uh, the UK voted on what they call Brexit and they left the European Union. It took almost five years for the divorce to be finalized. Uh, but there is now a separation and it finally became official. Now there are already some economic consequences of that divorce. Uh, there are other parts of the EU that are also now unraveling to some degree. There's some concern because the economies of Southern Europe are not as robust as the economies of Northern Europe. For example, Greece has a lot of unemployment, a lot of monetary problems. Portugal, Spain, Spain has like 25% unemployment. Um, and meanwhile, Germany is, you know, the biggest economy and tired of bailing everybody out. Uh, the British are already taking off and doing their own thing. The, the French are still concerned because, you know, the Germans have a little bit of a history of trying to kill everybody else. Um, and so that's a bit of a problem. Um, you know, so th where does the EU go? All right, in the future in terms of that. So as is currently the case, these are the members of the EU. Um, you'll notice that Ireland is still a member, but the UK is not. Um, the EU government has adopted English as their working language because, you know, English is your global lingua franca, right? But now none of the members of the EU, except for Ireland, speak English as a first language. So now there are some people saying, well, wait a second, if, if, if Great Britain's not even, if the UK is not even in the club anymore, why are we still speaking English at all these meetings? Of course, you know, it is the global lingua franca. Uh, but yeah, that's an interesting thing. Switzerland, famously independent, doesn't want to be part of the EU. They are part of the Schengen area. Uh, Norway, Iceland, also out on the periphery, not really interested in joining, but Sweden is in, Finland is in. Turkey has been knocking on the door for a long time, but nobody in Europe really wants to let Turkey in. Turkey's a lot poorer than the rest of Europe. Um, Turkey has a bit of a human rights issue with their Armenian and Kurdish problems. Um, however, there are some people in the EU that say, well, Turkey is a bridge into the Muslim world, um, you know, because Turkey is Muslim, but not Arabic and not Middle Eastern. It is European. But, you know, again, where does that go? Uh, you know, we'll see how that continues to play out. Oh, and I'll go back for a second. Let me go up just for a second. This is that little exclave that I told you about earlier. That's Kaliningrad. That's a piece of Russia that doesn't touch the rest of Russia. It's not an enclave because it's not totally surrounded. All right. 
So when you look at that, uh, that's a good example. Now, there is an enclave in Italy, right? There's actually two. So, uh, the Vatican City is inside the city of Rome, and that's the Pope, right? That's his territory. And then there's a little place called San Marino, and it's inside Italy. It's an old 13th century little principality that never gave up its sovereignty, and it's still there. There are other little micro states in Europe. One of them is Andorra, which is right there in the Pyrenees Mountains. It's not an enclave because it's not totally surrounded. Part of it touches France, part of it touches Spain. And it's also not an exclave because it's not a piece of anything else. So it's neither enclave nor exclave, right? So sometimes you can be both enclave and exclave, all right? And sometimes you can be just an enclave and sometimes you can be just an exclave. And if you want to see some that are enclaves and exclaves, we might look at this in class if you ask me, right? On the border between the Netherlands and Belgium, there's little places called Barl Nassau and Barl Hertog. And they're leftovers from like 700 years ago before they were Belgium and before they were the Netherlands. And the boundaries just never conformed to the modern day. And, and I'll tell you some funny stories about those places. All right. Um, Remember, we talked about the Schengen Agreement a lot in Unit 2 with migration. These are the members of the Schengen Agreement. Remember, if you go back, Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, not members of the EU, but they are members of the Schengen area. So there is free movement within them, even though they're not really members of the club. And then you look at the Eurozone. This is where you use the Euro currency. And of course, as you can see here, Iceland, Norway, Switzerland, uh -uh. We'll, we'll do the migration thing. We're keeping our currency. And notice even Swith, uh, Sweden, member of the EU, member of the Schengen Agreement, but does not use the euro currency, right? So there's some, there's some interesting things there between the different members. And as the Eastern European countries are becoming more and more and more, you see Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the Baltic states, not yet use, Estonia uses the euro, but the other two don't. Um, and, and certainly there's some layers of complexity as, as this goes on. All right. Where does Europe go in the future? I'll let you read through this. Um, you know, it, it, these are just some what ifs and, and some things that have happened recently. I'll talk about Putin more in just a second and uh, go ahead and pause and take a read through this slide. All right. Um, now. Some cartoons that dealt with the breakup of, uh, you know, Brexit separating from the EU, opening up Pandora's box. You can take a pause at some point and read through this. Um, you know, the idea of sovereignty versus, um, you know, losing control over your own migration, losing control over your own economic system, losing control environmentally. That was a big issue. Remember, I told you about Greece and their uh, economic problems. This is a famous cartoon from a decade or so ago when Greece was really in turmoil. And as you remember the great story from Greek mythology, uh, when Achilles was hit in the air in the ankle with the arrow and bled to death. Uh, and so basically this cartoon is making fun of the fact that this Euro currency is so powerful, but Greece might just be the tiny little you know, hit in the ankle that's going to bring down the whole European Union. So these are just, you know, some artists' uh, interpretations of what some of these crises are within the EU. And again, in a COVID world, do there need to be restrictions on travel? Do there need to be restrictions on, you know, migration throughout the EU? Now, other places in the world, I already talked to you a little bit about the United States-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement. Um, I've already talked to you about some of these other uh, supranational organizations. Didn't mention OPEC. We should say that real quick. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. These are countries that uh, produce and export oil. Be careful. They're not all Middle Eastern. They're not all Arabic. Venezuela is an OPEC member. Nigeria is an OPEC member. Uh, they do both produce tremendous amounts of oil, and they are members of OPEC. Um, so make sure you know uh, these are sometimes called cartels, and that's kind of like you hear a drug cartel. It's a group. It's a club. It's an organization. They seek to control supply and demand of that, uh, you know, finite, uh, scarce resource. Now, we need to talk about devolution, and this is whenever the central government is losing power, 
And so in a devolutionary environment, the central government will be getting weaker. Sometimes a central government can do this voluntarily. They can give up some control, what we call regional autonomy that you've heard me talk about a couple of times. Um, Puerto Rico, for example. And, and sometimes these regional groups are demanding separation. And so you give them a little bit of control, hoping that they won't try to physically separate and ultimately create their own sovereign state, right? But devolution is this kind of force that kind of ebbs and flows. And you can see it in Canada with the Quebec uh, voters. You can see it in, in America, in the United States with Hawaii. You can see it in a lot of places in the world where the central government is losing some kind of power. Now, in an extreme case, it can cause the breakup of a country. It could be peaceful. Czechoslovakia in the 90s, they went to the polls and they voted and the Czech voters and the Slovak voters said, hey, we don't want to be together anymore. Uh, you know, it's not you, it's me kind of a thing. And they agreed to split. And now there's a Czech Republic and there's the Republic of Slovakia. Now, that one was peaceful. They actually called that one the velvet divorce because velvet is nice and smooth. <laughs> but then there's also the violent ones. And this is sometimes called balkanization. In the Balkan Peninsula, you used to have the country of Yugoslavia. And this was basically seven countries that after World War I, the, the allies just put them all together in one big country. Nobody asked them if they wanted that or not. They didn't. And, and 80 years later, it violently broke up. Um, this is Serbia. This is Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Slovenia, um, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Today, that's North Macedonia. Montenegro, the newly independent Kosovo, and there's still friction there. In the 90s, this erupted into a horrific war. There was ethnic cleansing. There was genocide going on. Um, some war crimes were, were brought to light. Um, even still today, it's not a good situation, but it is much calmer and better than it was. Um, Serbo-Croatian used to be thought of as one language. Today, Serbs and Croats will not tell you that they speak the same language. They'll tell you that it's Serbian and Croatian instead of Serbo-Croatian. Um, most, uh, most other people in the world will still hear it as one language, but they'll insist that it's two because of the political break, uh, political breakup. And again, devolution can ultimately create failed states. Now, we've already talked about this ethno-nationalism quite a lot, right? Um, I don't feel British. I feel Scottish. I don't feel Spanish. I feel Catalan. I'm not Canadian. I'm Quebecois, right? Um, I, I'm not Nigerian. Uh, I'm Igbo. I'm not Chinese. I'm a Uyghur, right? Notice that almost always these people are in peripheral parts of the state. They're not in the core areas. They're not in the most important economic areas. They're not in the areas where, you know, the capital city is. So they're, they're politically marginalized. They're economically marginalized. They're socially and culturally marginalized. They often feel picked on and persecuted and, and left out. And, and historically, uh, they just have these movements that they want to separate, right? Separatism. Now, there's another kind of this. And it's irredentism. And this is when I always think of it like the dentist might pull your tooth out. Irredentism is when a neighbor state comes in and tries to take territory away from your state. Now, we did this. We, we took, you know, territory away from Mexico, right, in the Mexican War. Um, you know, Putin went into Ukraine and, and took the Crimea away from Ukraine. And, and by the way, there is some, you know, suspicion that Putin might be angling to take the rest of Ukraine. And Ukraine is turning to the NATO people and saying, hey, can we, can, can, can we join NATO? Because we would like to be in a group that could defend us if the Russians come in to attack. And, and that's some interesting current events going on. Um, Serbia wanted the parts of Bosnia that were Serbs. They didn't care about the Bosnians. And, and that's why some of the Bosnians got exterminated because the Serbs didn't care about them. Uh, they just wanted the Serbs to be part of Serbia. And the Croats wanted Croats to be part of Croatia. And, and neither one of them cared anything about Bosnian Muslims. And, and so they were kind of stuck in the middle. This is what we call irredentism, when, when you take away territory that belongs to another state. 
Here's those places where devolution is very, very powerful. Again, I'll give you a second. Toggle back. Look at, look at this. Now, not all those people in that list there are Europeans. Some are in Asia, some are in Africa, some are in other places. But take a look at these places that are uh, either ethno-nationalistic or irredentist. All right. Notice peripheral locations. Uh, other forces of devolution, they can certainly be things like economic, social, cultural, political, environmental, um, obviously, typically in, in peripheral areas. Uh, sometimes fragmentation plays a role. Again, archipelagic states that are already broken up into thousands of little islands. Um, you know, certainly economics, the Catalonia part of Spain is by far Spain's most important economic region. And sometimes they say, well, wait a second, if, if we just break away and create our own country, then, you know, why, why do we need to be part of Spain? I mean, we, we could economically survive on our own. Um, if you go to Barcelona, there's a big statue um, and, and, and it's a statue of Columbus. And, and he's actually looking out into the Mediterranean where he came from in Genoa. And it's interesting because when before Spain started exploring into the New World, Barcelona was a big important part. Um, Spain always wanted Barcelona in that area of Catalonia to be part of the kingdoms of Spain because it was the part that was closest to Europe. But then when Spain started exploring the Western Hemisphere and all the gold and the silver came from the New World, Barcelona became backwards and isolated and not important because it was the farthest away from the New World, right? If you look at Spain on a map. Well, now that Spain's no longer owning all these places in the New World, and now that the EU is a big thing, suddenly Barcelona is important again. And, and we talk about site and situation, and that's really important. The site of Barcelona, the site of Catalonia has not changed ever in 500 years, but the situation, right? it changed away and now it's changing back. And that's why site and situation are such important words in our class and understanding the patterns and the processes. All right, geopolitics, this is again the, the, the control over territory. There is a German school uh, that was Frederick Ratzel that countries are like organisms. They're born, they live, they die, and they need space, right? This is the elbow room kind of idea in America. And if you guys have ever seen the old classic schoolhouse rock, you know about elbow room, right? Hitler famously said that that living space, the Lebensraum, was going to be found in the East. And that's why they attacked the Soviets. Stalin apparently didn't read the book and, and, and he created a, a deal with Hitler at the beginning of the war. They split Poland. They were big buddies. And then suddenly he's like, what? You know, here comes the Germans. They're attacking us. Hitler always said that the, the living space was going to be in the East because Germany couldn't find living space West. Europe is tiny. Asia opens up, right? It's huge. So early on, uh, there were some political scientist thinkers who said, well, controlling space is important. And they developed these theories or models that, you know, the pivot area of Eastern Europe was going to be vital. This guy's name was Halford Mackinder. And he said that this area in Eastern Europe along the steppes of Russia, this would be the, the heartland. And if you could control the heartland, you would control the whole world. Well, he was really embarrassed when Russia lost a war against Japan, right? And I, I don't know if you know this, but in 1905, Russia and Japan fought a war over Korea. Japan won, Russia lost. Uh, the French were alarmed because their big ally was Russia against their big enemy, Germany. Uh, and, and so then this is when the French and the British finally thawed their centuries old uh, enmity towards each other. And they created a deal, which ultimately in World War I helped them out. But this was the, the, the heartland theory. And then in the, in the Cold War, in the post-World War II time, we, we see this rimland theory emerge where uh, a guy at Yale, Nicholas Spikeman, talked about it's not so much the heartland, but you've got to control the rimland around it. Um, and this is going to be what you see a lot today, the Middle East, India, China, um, and Eastern Europe becoming important. Um, both of these theories forget about naval power, which that's a book by Alfred Mahan. It's called The Influence of Sea Power in History. And that is very important because today 
the United States is the biggest power because of our naval power, uh, not so much because of land power. And there's a cool little drawing that shows you what the heartland and the rimland looks like. All right, why does geography matter? Obviously, in a Cold War environment, it was the United States and the Soviet Union against each other. But today, in a post-Cold War world, the United States is usually the only superpower. But are we going to stay in power for all time? We don't know. There are some threats to you know, hegemony in, in, the, um, in the world today. China getting stronger. What does the EU do after Brexit? Is Putin going to stay in power? He's already been in, in power in, Europe, in, in Russia for over 20 years. Uh, I can tell you, Putin loves geography. Most of these political leaders know geography. And, and, and sadly, Americans are mostly geographically illiterate, which, you know, that's a big problem. Um, but uh, geography matters, right? Everything is geographical and geography is everything, right? So it's important as we study politics to understand the geography. All right, decolonization. I'll let you read through this. I've already talked about this a little bit in the slideshow. We talked about that Berlin conference. We've talked about the fact that the European powers spread their Christianity, spread their Indo-European languages. But in the post in the post World War II era, most of these countries allowed their colonies to become independent. Okay, however, they still maintain an economic relationship with them, which we call neo colonialism. Neo means new. I'll let you take a check, uh, take a chance to read. All right. We're getting close to dark here. <laughs> when I started, it was still daytime. So I know these videos are long. Don't forget, chunk it, watch a little bit at a time, make popcorn, invite your friends, maybe sell it to others. I don't know, right? Maybe I need to start doing product placement in these videos, like a Chick-fil-A cup or something like that. At any rate, we only have a couple more parts to go. Here's that map that shows you the colonialism of the world. Now notice Latin America doesn't show up. That's because this map is colonialism after 1800. Most of the uh, Latin American colonies, the Brazilians became independent of Portugal in the 1880s. Most of the Latin American countries became independent in Spain, either in the early 1800s or certainly by the 1820s. Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, the Bolivarian countries that all have those yellow, blue, and red flags, uh, they all became independent in the early decades of the 1800s. All right, last but not least, we have to talk about electoral geography. These are internal political boundaries. And in the United States, these are sometimes reflective of what we call political cleavages. And these are the issues that surround things like abortion, things like um, you know taxes and things like the role of government in climate change, vaccine mandates, all of these kinds of things. This can be really defined by political affiliation. We can use GIS to map a lot of this. And certainly when you watch election coverage on TV, whether you watch the network that supports the right or the network that supports the left, you're going to get these cool maps of the red states and the blue states and the purple states. And they'll interview voters and they'll say, how did left-handed people who were born on a Tuesday, how did they vote? And, and you know, they really can get down to really intimate local levels of voting. So we need to understand that electoral geography is at different scales. So we can talk about national elections. We can talk about state elections. We can talk about voting for school board uh, or the mayor or the county commissioners, right? So political geography can really change scale on us. Make sure you're able to talk about that. If they give you an essay or an FRQ that has to do with governance, make sure you understand, are they talking about the federal level? Are they talking about the local level? Are they talking about that regional level in between, you know, the 50 states, right? Now, we have to know some, know some vocab words, reapportionment. This is when they recalculate the seats in the House of Representatives. There are 435 seats. They have to represent Americans roughly equally, but that is increasingly getting harder because some states like Wyoming, they, don't only, they only have 600,000 people in the whole state of Wyoming. Palm Beach County has more people than that. So what's happening is the bigger states, they're breaking up into these you know, uh, electoral districts and, and Florida has 20 something of them, but Wyoming is one electoral district all by itself. 
because you, you don't have a representative that represents more than one state. So the whole state of Wyoming is under one electoral district. Now, reapportionment is when we reallocate the seats. Redistricting, they might have to redraw the maps. And that can result in some funny business, some shady, you know, sketchy, you know, activities where one party or the other tries to draw the boundaries in such a way as to gain an advantage politically. Now, this is against the law, except in some cases where the courts will say, for minority representation, you might be required to create a gerrymandered district. And this is the word gerrymandering because historically there was a case where Elbridge Jerry, the governor of Massachusetts back in the 1800s, they drew some funky maps and, and that just became the, the lexicon was, oh, it's not a salamander, it's a gerrymander. And that's where that word gerrymandering comes from. How does gerrymandering work? Usually it's packing, cracking, hijacking, or kidnapping. And in the case of packing, by the way, here are some current examples. Uh, and by the way, these are not all Republican states. These are not all Democratic states. These are all kinds of states, some urban areas, some rural areas, some states in the north, some states in the south, some states in the east, some states out west. It, it happens a lot, this gerrymandering. This has been on the AP exam as an FRQ with a visual stimulus. So you have to recognize, hey, that's a funky looking district. That might be gerrymandered. But what you're going to see is that there's... There's perfect representation where, you know, red is, let's say red's Republican and blue is Democrat. There's perfect representation where if blue outnumbers red, blue should win, right? That's pure democracy. That's just a you know, straight up vote. But what if we pack, you know, six blues and four reds in every single district and go horizontally like that? Well, now what we'll get is blue will win all five times. Red doesn't get anything. That's not fair, but that's the way they can draw that. Or they can crack it and they can say, oh, let's put almost all blue in two of them, right? So you see uh, one of the blue ones is like there's nine or eight blues. And, and then the other one will be six to four red will win. Red actually wins three times, even though they're the minority, because you took a ton of blues and stuck them into only two districts. Right? And you say, OK, we'll let you win that district nine to one, but you're only going to win twice and we'll win six to four in the other three and we'll outvote you every time. And, and so this packing and cracking can really, really create a problem. And there's also some what they call hijacking and kidnapping. And that's where they'll sometimes take somebody's district away from them because you're supposed to live in the district that you represent. There's all kinds of shenanigans that can happen. What's, what's being pushed a lot is, is they want nonpartisan people making the districts and they want the districts to be fair and they want every district to be competitive. The reason why gerrymandering becomes a problem is because people look at this and they say, my vote doesn't matter. If I live in a blue district where it's nine to one, blue outnumbers red, if I'm the red voter, I'm like, well, wh why, why do I even care? I'm going to lose. And if I'm the blue voter, I might not even bother to vote because, oh, we're going to win so much. It doesn't matter if I go. We don't want to be in the business of discouraging Americans from exercising their civic responsibilities. Right. So that's the issue with gerrymandering. It doesn't create competition. It creates an inherent unfairness. And, and certainly we would like to see all states being more competitive. Let, listen, California is not competitive. Right. If, if you're a Democrat, you're going to win. Texas is not all that competitive. Florida is very competitive, but some states are not very competitive and other states are. And some states used to not be competitive, but suddenly they are now like Georgia. And, and, and states can go through these cycles. But generally speaking, right, the partisanship and the geography of it is, is what gerrymandering is all about. So here are the election results, by the way, from the recent presidential election in 2020. Only two states are not winner take all. Nebraska is not winner take all. Maine is not winner take all. All of the other states, if you win one more vote than half, you get all of the electoral votes, right? That's the way the founding fathers decided to do it. There are some people who say maybe we should reconsider that, right? But other people say, well, wait a second, you know, founding fathers have done pretty well so far. Let's let them, you know, keep making decisions. But generally speaking, right, the state map 
is going to look different than the county map because red states are not so red and blue states are not so blue. All right, so we need to understand the voting patterns. Liberal places tend to be urban places, right? Conservative places tend to be rural places. And, and therefore, there's a lot more red on the map, but there's a lot more people in the blue areas and there's a lot less people in the red areas. And so we really have to understand how geography matters, right? When we talk about voting patterns and electoral geography. All right. I know we took a long time. I hope you enjoyed it. Chunk it. Watch it a little bit at a time. Read that AMSCO book. Make sure you do that Quizlet. And we'll take another uh, exam right, on political geography patterns and processes before the winter break. Be healthy. I'll talk to you guys soon.